I was also thankful for the songs that we sang today. Um, I think all of them were prayers to God. I think the last one was, was more just reaffirming our, our beliefs about Christ. But I think it's so appropriate for what we'll talk about today. We'll be in Psalm 86. Uh, I believe you've been going through the Psalms the last few weeks. Psalm 69 last week, if I remember correctly. Psalm 69. Uh, so we will be walking through that particular Psalm today. Before we do that, please turn to Philippians chapter 1, just as a platform to launch us and kind of give us a framework for our time together. Philippians chapter 1. As you do that, just a little bit of context. As Paul is writing, he's under house arrest. He's under a 24-hour guard. Um, his life is not at all pleasant. But he pens this book to the church in Philippi. And he talks about how God has used the time of his affliction for his glory. And in the midst of that affliction, Paul says he rejoices. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 18, after thinking through all that he's going through, people that are saying bad things about him, his imprisonment, then he kind of gives his outlook. How do I think through all of this that's happening to me while I'm in prison? Verse 18, what then? What then when I consider all of this? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. It's almost as if he's so defiant at this point. And he says in verse 19, a very uh, amazing verse that has struck me for years. Verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. That word and, there, that conjunction and, has always struck me. In that Paul, in a sense, almost puts at par the prayers of the saints and the help of the Holy Spirit in the outworking of God's plan in his life. Does that make sense? We're not at all saying that we're reducing the Holy Spirit or his importance or his person, but in how God works things out in his mind in which we can never reconcile here on earth, he uses both the prayers of the saints and the help of the Holy Spirit in working out his plans. What's the point? The point is that it matters when we pray. It matters to God when we pray. We don't need to be convinced of how we should pray. Every Christian knows they should pray. <laughs> they should be in that relationship with God. We know God uses our prayers. We know God is sovereign and works even when we don't pray. But he uses those, those two truths are, are true. It matters when we pray. When we look at Psalm 86 today, it is a psalm where we see David also coming to the Lord in prayer. My concern this morning is not so much to convince you how you should pray or the frequency of your prayers, but I'm often, I'm often um, discouraged by the content of our prayers. And that's what I'd like for us to focus today, the content of our prayers as we look through how David even prays in the midst of him going through an affliction. It's interesting, when I saw that it was Psalm 86, um, uh, just last week at our, at our local church, at Covenantus Christian Church, I was preaching on prayer as well, but it was from Matthew chapter 6. So I think the Lord wants me to keep studying and talking about prayer. Um, but it, it's, there, there's certain truths and values that I would want us to look at and think through in how are your prayers? What is the content of your prayers? Let me pray for us as we um, open up God's word in Psalm 86, and Lord willing, God will uh, give us grace and wisdom this morning. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for being a good, good God, a God who is kind and gracious and compassionate, a God who is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you do not or never lie. 
you are always true. And Father, as we think of ourselves in light of you, we see how much we lack so much. We are so much in lack in our hearts. We are so sinful before you. We are so needy, as the psalm will say later on. But we're so thankful, Father, that we do serve a God who is like no other, a God who hears our cries and our concerns, a God who is concerned about our growth above all, a God who brings trials and tribulation in our lives so that we may know you. I pray, Father, that you may incline our hearts, that our hearts may be uh, aligned to your will, our hearts may be aligned to the fear of your name. Father, help us, even as we uh, look at this psalm today, to see where you'd want us to grow, where you'd want us to change, to live here encouraged and be better Christians, better servants of Christ than we were before we walked in. I ask and pray this through your son's name. Amen. Psalm 86. I'll just read the psalm through, and then we will uh, walk through it uh, and make some observations. A prayer of David, Psalm 86. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant. For you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and I shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O God, insolent men have risen up against me. A brand of ruthless men seek my life and they do not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. This is God's word for us today. Now, as we think through this psalm of David, a prayer that he's going to give to the Lord in this time of trouble, you cannot help but, like any passage in the scripture, think and try to see what does David keep trying to emphasize and keep on repeating. Now, if you have been following in this psalm, you will see that there are hints of Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 to 7, that really form the theological framework where David will be, of how David will be praying. If you recall, in Exodus chapter 34, Moses is at Sinai. And earlier on in Exodus chapter 33, God would have uh, been speaking to Moses, and then Moses asks in that very familiar passage and says, God, show me your what? Show me your glory. He's been having all these challenges, even with Israel, and he says, God, I just want to know you more. Show me your glory. God says he will put Moses in a cleft of a rock, and he will have all his goodness passed before Moses, 
and God himself will proclaim his name. And God does that in Exodus chapter 34 and proclaims it. In Exodus 34, verse 6 to 7, you don't have to turn there, it says, Then the Lord passed in front of him, in front of Moses, and proclaimed, this is the Lord proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Remember, Moses is not allowed to see the face of God as this happens. But whatever he experienced and whatever he felt and was allowed to know at that point, it was overwhelming for him. And it gave him so much confidence that his hope, indeed Israel's hope, in the wilderness, and all the challenges that were going to be there was only going to be in God alone. It says in Exodus 34, verse 8 and 9, Moses made haste to bow low before the earth and worship when this happened, when he came face to face to God. He said, if, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go along in our midst, even though the people are so obstinate and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your own possession. Even though, even though I'm going to go through all these trials with these people, I know my hope rests in Lord. So David, as he wrote in Psalm 86, knew of this occurrence and knew God as the one who is compassionate and the one who is gracious, one who is slow to anger, one who is abounding in loving kindness and truth, who forgive sins and will not leave the guilty unpunished. You see, David's high view of God shapes his prayers. And he approaches his prayers with that framework. Look at verse 5, as we saw, in, as, we, as I read. Verse 5 of Psalm 86. For you, Lord, are good. Think of Exodus 34 in your minds. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. Again, verse 13, for your loving kindness toward me is great, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Again, verse 15, but you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth. So you see that and how that really shapes David's prayer. And as David writes Psalm 86, it is clear, yes, that he's going through some adversity. He's going through trouble. He doesn't specify what the trouble is. We don't even know what time this is, but he's going through something very difficult. And you may be going through that today. You may be going through that trial or some kind of trial that no one here but you knows, some adversity. But understand this, as David did and as Moses did, although circumstances may seem hopeless, though they may seem uncertain and overwhelming, God does not change. He doesn't change in being good. He doesn't change in being gracious. He doesn't change in being merciful, and he doesn't change in being compassionate. And David affirms that. What else does David know of God in this psalm? He knows in verse 8, it says, There is no one like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. There is none like the Lord in character and none like the Lord in his works. God is, I like to use this term, other than all that you can ever imagine, all that you can think, all that you can ever know, all that has existed, all that exists today, all that can ever exist. The same idea is carried through in verse 10 of Psalm, 80, uh, Psalm 86. For you are great and do wondrous deeds. You alone are God. Now this is why earlier in verse 9, and if you have your Bibles, it will be helpful. You just keep looking at those verses. I think they'll help. That will help. This is why earlier in verse 9, David says... God deserves all the glory, and one day all the nations 
will come and worship him and give God the glory. As I mentioned about the Lord's Prayer that I was speaking on last week, it's amazing when, 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 when you look at the petitions there, it's our Father who we're addressing, right? Um, who art in heaven, your will be done. Your will be done. May your rule and the fear of you be in the hearts of all people, is what we're praying. We ought to pray knowing that one day, because there is no one like God, all the peoples will worship him and glorify him, whether in heaven or in hell. And that should be our heart, continuously. Even the ones that cause us adversity here on earth. But I want you to know and see that in this psalm, as I've been looking at the character of God that David is even pointing to and, and, and his prayers are so rich with, I want you to see that in this psalm, which is a cry of help for David, which is a prayer of David, I want you to see that in this prayer, this prayer is not divorced from the character and worship of God in the midst of adversity. You know, you start thinking, I said my, con my concern oftentimes is of the contents of our prayers. And oftentimes, the content of our prayers is just so focused on me, my struggle, my trouble, my needs, and is so divorced from the character of God. But you don't see that here. You don't see that here. We have much to learn about prayer from this psalm. Prayer is hinged on the character of God, should be hinged on the character of God. Even prayer for help. Prayer should be saturated with the character of God. And you see that even in the Lord's Prayer. Think about it. Our Father, who art in heaven, right? Think, don't let this be so familiar to you. Our Father, who art in heaven. Let's say, what's the next line? Amen. Hallowed be your name. You see, who is that pointing to? These are the first, there are going to be three requests that come. Hallowed be your name. I have a concern for your name, a concern for your glory, that it may be sanctified, it may be seen as holy, right? That's the first petition. Hallowed be your name. What's the next one? Thy kingdom come. Hey, there's not even me yet in there, right? Thy kingdom come. I want your kingdom to rule in the hearts of everyone here on earth. I want to look forward to Jesus coming. What's the next line? Your will, I'm not there yet. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want your will to be done in the hearts of everyone who is here on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, there is always worship. Your will is always done in heaven, right? But I want to see that here on earth in the midst of all this greed and corruption. That is my heart. See those three first three petitions? What's the next petition? That's only when you come in. <laughs> right? But all of this has been focused on the glory of God, on the kingdom of God, on the plans of God, on the desires of God. And when you have that, that really shapes everything you're going to pray about yourself. Because then it will always be connected to the glory of God and the kingdom of God and the will of God. And you see that here with David. That he does not divorce, even though he's coming and saying, I want to pray, I am going through this affliction. He does not divorce that from the character, the needs, and the will of God. Prayer should be punctuated with the character of God. This helps put our requests into line with how we should pray and want to pray and align our will with his will. So this is David's prayer. And as he asked God to incline his ear to him, right? We've seen the character of God, but then we see this request. He will ask God, incline your ear to me, in verse 1, incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me. In verse 2, he's going to pray, preserve my life and save me. In verse 3, be gracious to me. In verse 4, gladden my soul. Help me to turn to you, verse 16, be gracious and give me strength. Verse 17, he will also pray that God may strengthen his faith and show him a sign of his favor. In all of this, 
we see that David has a right view, as he asks, has a right view of God, but he's also going to have a right view of himself in that prayer, in light of the character of God. And it's fascinating when you look at uh, particularly the first four verses, it's almost like he gives reasons <laughs> why God should be um, listening to his prayer, right? I, I, I couldn't help but laugh as I was, not laugh in a bad way, but I was like, wow, um, the maturity of this prayer. In verse 1, incline your ear, look at that, those small, that small word, for, right? Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am needy and I'm poor and needy. Preserve my life for, do you see that, verse 2? Verse 3, be gracious, O Lord, for. Verse 3, gladden the soul of your servant for, do you see that? But in all these reasons that he's praying, there's going to be a right view of himself that he's going to give in light of God's character. Look at some of these views, this, this view of David. He says in verse 1, for I am poor and needy, right? And, and I've wondered whether I've come to God and said, God, I'm so poor and so needy, right? And oftentimes we think poor in terms of physical things, right? But when you think of this, this is a phrase David uses quite often in the Psalms of being poor and needy. And I went through some of the passages, Psalm 40 verse 17, you have to turn there. But after talking about his sin, overtaking him and his enemies encompassing him, and then he says he is poor and needy in Psalm 40, verse 17. Context of his sin and context of adversity. He also uses that phrase in Psalm 109, in verse 21 to 22, when he asks God to deal on his behalf for God's name's sake and for God to deliver him from his enemies. And he says, for I am poor and needy. He is distressed is the pattern that will be there. He is in need of hope. That's the pattern that will be there. In, he says in Psalm um, 109, verse 24, that my, my, my knees, he says, are weak through fasting and my body is wasting. And so I am poor and needy. I'm going through this really, really tough time. I'm going through trying to search my soul. I want to know you, Lord. I am poor and I am needy. So we go back to Psalm 86. David knows his true condition. He needs God, saying, God, I need you. And that's what really prayer is. It's a, it's a dependence on God, understanding that by yourself you are so insufficient. You show me someone who doesn't pray, I will show you someone who relies on themselves so much. How often you pray is a marker of how much you're dependent for strength on the Lord. Yeah, that's sad when you, I mean, if we're just to take a poll in this room, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to <laughs> scare you. Like, how often are you praying beyond the, Father, thank you for this food. Amen. Right? And waiting till the end of the day when you're so tired and wiped out and you fall asleep after the second line of your prayer and you wake up in the morning. I started praying last night. I don't remember where I ended. You wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is just take a hold of your phone. Right? But like I said, the point here is not to convince you how you ought to pray. You know that already. So David knows his true condition. He needs God. Do you need God? Is that shown in your prayer life? Not just the content, but the frequency? He needs God. God, I need you, he's saying. I'm so insufficient by myself. That's how he starts this. I'm unable by myself, whether it is to deal with affliction or to see myself sufficiently in light of you. This is why his prayer will often be punctuated by the character of God. Because I'm so insufficient, but you are so what? Sufficient. I'm so needy, but you are great, and you do wondrous things. I'm so needy and insufficient, so I will come to you who is gracious and merciful and forgiving. Your Exodus 34. 
his condition again in verse 2. Connected to his request, right? Incline your ear, verse 1. Incline your ear, O God, and answer me, for I am poor and I am needy. Right? Kind of poor and needy, again, just a fleeting thought. You know, your sermon on the mount, blessed are the poor and what? Spirit, right? But then in verse 2, his condition again, connected to his prayer, preserve my life. The ESV actually says preserve my life. But I think the NSAB, if you have it, translates this better and well, because that's the Hebrew word nefesh, which speaks um, of the, primarily of the soul, right? Genesis 1 or Genesis 2, God breathed into man and he became a living nefesh, soul. But that's the same word that he uses there. So literally, it should really be preserve my soul. Although I can hear, I can understand the life part. Preserve my soul. And that's the, that's the same word he'll use later on in verse 13, that God has delivered his soul from Sheol. So David asks God, preserve my soul. But look at the reason there. Why? Why? It's there, it's there. In, you can read it. What, it's not on my face. For I'm what? Devoted. I'm devoted to you. Is that your, what your version says? Okay, what version is that? NIV? Okay, that's good. I'm devoted to you. I actually like that, that, that version. I didn't look at it. I looked at two other versions. Okay, I'm devoted to you. Uh-huh, what does it say? I'm faithful. I'm faithful. Which version is that? HCSP. HCSP. I definitely didn't look at that one. Okay. <laughs> okay, where's another version? Yes. I'm holy. I am holy. Wow, look at that. I'm holy. Uh-huh. I am godly. Like, can you pray and say to God, God, <laughs> preserve my soul for I am godly. Preserve my soul for I am holy. And I looked at them like, what? I'm holy. I am godly. But I think the other two versions that were mentioned um, earlier on, so helpful in, in, in thinking through what that is actually talking about. Like I said, at first it seems prideful and presumptuous. Like I come to you and say, God, I am holy. I'm a godly man, some of your versions say. But godly here is qualified by the fact that David says in the next line that he trusts in God. He wants to do God's will and is God's servant. He wants to please God. He wants to grow in knowing God. Later on in this prayer in verse 11, look at verse 11. And remember the context is of David needs something. He's going through trials and adversity. It doesn't seem like it at this stage. But then he says in verse 11 later on, thinking through, I am godly. I trust God. I want to know God. Verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I want to grow. I want to walk in truth. I don't want my heart to be divorced from fearing your name. And when the Bible talks about the name of God, it's talking about the glory of God, everything that God stands for. I don't want my life to be divorced from fearing your name. So preserve my soul, O Lord. Preserve my soul. I look at that prayer and I'm ashamed at how often my prayers are. And there's a great lesson and challenge here to say, when I ask God for what I ask for, what is the ultimate purpose? What is the ultimate goal that is there? Is the end of what I ask for my satisfaction? Is that the end? Is the end my comfort? Or is it, as we see in the psalm, is the end of everything that I ask for, even if it's in the midst of trial of adversity, is the end of it all connected to the glory of God? Me serving him better, me learning more about God's ways, me walking more in his truth. Is my heart united with the fear of his name in everything that I ask for? Some of you may know the past year has been quite 
um, difficult for us. My wife was um, diagnosed with this autoimmune disease that just threw off a lot of things in, in my family. Um, endless hospital visits, um, crazy financial issues that come with that. And with all of that, there is no cure. You know there is no cure. It's a life condition. My prayers were challenged a lot. In what do I actually pray for? What do I actually pray for? And what is the end of all of this? If God has brought this into our life, and God is always good and compassionate, right? And abounding in loving kindness. That is there in the midst of this trial, right? Because God doesn't change. So can I pray in the midst of that and say, God, through this, teach me your ways. Help me to be so focused on the glory of your name in how even I love my wife in the midst of this. When we do not have, teach me your ways and help me. And my, may this be for my good and my wife's good and our family's good. Can I pray that? And I think that's the challenge that we see here from David. In that he's so consumed by the glory of God, and the end goal of him asking all of what he's asking is that he may be more godly. He is already godly, he is already devoted, and he wants to grow in that godliness. Is my heart united with the fear of his name, even in the midst of adversity? He will ask and say in verse 4, make, again, in, in, in a right view of himself, make glad the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Make me rejoice in the midst of this adversity, in the midst of all this confusion. Make me rejoice in my soul because I lift my soul up to you. Why do I do what I do and why do I live the way that I live? Again, it all comes back to you. But also notice, not just the character of God is saturated in this prayer, and not just the true condition of David is saturated in this prayer, but you also see in the midst of his asking the thankfulness that is there in the midst of a difficult situation. In all this affliction that he hints at in verse 14, in verse 14 he talks about, you know, affliction from insolent and arrogant and violent men, he says in verse 12, in the midst of all of this, Affliction, verse 12, look at that. I will give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and will glorify your name forever. Now here's the challenge. Give thanks to the Lord always, <laughs> especially in times of affliction, distress, trials, and suffering. This is, this is unlike what the world would teach. The world would say if there's suffering and trials and all of this, something is wrong. Right? You're not being obedient. God, you've lost God's favor. Whatever that may be, there's something wrong. But here David sees it as just right. And I would thank God in those times. He connected this give, giving thanks with verse 11 that we looked at earlier. He wants God to teach him. That's how he could give thanks. He wants God to teach him his ways, to walk in truth, unite God's heart with the fear of God's name, unite his heart with the fear of God's name. This is basically Paul saying in Philippians 3, verse 8 to 11, more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Listen to verse 10 of Philippians 3. That I may know him. That I may know him. 
and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. I found myself oftentimes praying and saying, thank you, God, that my wife is sick. Because without that, I would not have known where I lack as a husband that pleases you. I would not have seen my selfishness more. <laughs> we would not have seen how much we rely so much on ourselves. Thank you, Lord, that I'm receiving all this adversity, whatever you are having, to actually come before the Lord and say thank you. Because I count all things as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ. How much are you thankful for in your prayers? Even when it's hard. This is the thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the illness that is here right now. Thank you, Lord, for this disruption in my relationship with my friend. Thank you, Lord, for this accident. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for this uncertainty with my job. Thank you, Lord, for my struggle with my children. Thank you, Lord, for, for, for this struggle with my husband and my wife. Thank you, because I know you wanted to bear fruit in teaching me more your way and not being bitter and angry and not reflecting who you are. How is the content of your prayers? But also what I love, finally, about this psalm and the lessons on prayer it gives us is that it also shows David in his humanness. Even as he prays to the Lord, he's like that father of that boy with the unclean spirit in Luke chapter 9, you may remember him, who cried out to Jesus when, 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 he, when he wants his son to be healed and he cries out in Luke chapter 9 verse 24 to Jesus and he says, Lord, I believe, but help my what? Help my unbelief. It's such an honest prayer. David has this moment in the last verse of this psalm. And he says, show me a sign for good that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed because you, O oh Lord, have helped me and comforted me. In his weakness, David banks on God being compassionate and gracious even in his struggle in prayer. Now, I'm not sure what David expected here, and I'm not going to speculate in terms of this sign. But what he's basically saying is, God, help my faith. I trust you. But please help my faith. You are the Father who sees all in secret. And sometimes we pray as if, we pray as if we're talking to someone in this church who does not see our heart, right? <laughs> and and we, I mean, our prayers are so like wooden, as if, you know, I'm just talking to this someone, some force or something, but this is the prayer to a father who sees all that is secret, including all that is in my heart. You know, I have to hide to God that you're struggling even in that prayer. And David doesn't hide that. He says, I know these things about me. I know these things about you. And I know there's this affliction that is there. But God, at the same time, I am also struggling. Our prayers ought to be that honest. Like I said, I don't know what he was expecting and how God may have answered that. But I do know that sometimes God does encourage us in our faith through various ways, particularly through his word. When I read that, hey, if you desire to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. It makes sense to me, right? <laughs> And my faith is strengthened even in bad situations. He encourages my faith in the counsel of his people. That's how we, why it's so important that we ought to encourage one another each day, as long as it is called today. And I think it is good to be honest in that prayer. God, I am struggling in my faith. Please help me. So, how are you doing in your prayer, as the psalm teaches us today? How are you doing in your prayer? How are your prayers when they're actually there? Are your prayers centered and hinged on the character of God? Are they honest as to your true condition before God? Are they centered on the glory of God or your glory? Are they centered 
on giving thanks to God in all circumstances? Are they honest before your father who sees all in secret? Let us pray. Father, thank you for our time this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness in your word and through your word. And you have told us, Lord, that your word would not go void. And I do ask and pray that this morning, Father, your will be done in our hearts as we see some of the things that you call us to have evident in our prayer lives. Father, forgive us, forgive us, because we're so selfish in our prayers. You say in James 4, what is the source of your quarrels and conflicts? You ask and you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. And that is often true of us. But thank you that you are kind and gracious and compassionate and you're slow to anger, that even as we pray those selfish prayers, you are slow to anger and you are forgiving. That you have given us the provision of the Holy Spirit, as you say in Romans 8, who prays according to your will as we pray. Thank you that you have given us Christ who continuously intercedes for us. I, 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 I am ashamed and I know we should all be ashamed, but oftentimes when we pray, I have to wonder how much the Holy Spirit would also be praying and contradicting my prayers, because they would not be according to your will. Please help me, help our hearts to be aligned to your heart, to have nothing more of concern than your glory and your name, even in all that we ask for. Thank you for trials. Thank you for your word when it rebukes us. Thank you that you who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ. We do long for that day. Help us not to be comfortable in this world and to genuinely cry out as John did that come Lord Jesus, may your kingdom come. We're so tired of this world, Lord. Help us not to be caught up in all the greed and ambition and love of this world. There's something much better that is there, of surpassing value, and that is of knowing Christ and being with Christ. But while we're here, Lord, help us to remember that our time here means fruitful labor, but to be with Christ is far much better. So thank you, Father. We ask and pray this through your Son's name. Amen.